it's so important, I think, that we understand what is actually taking place here because we've got to get at the real source of this thing. That's why Christian behavioralism is just bankrupt. Just trying to get Christians to behave properly is just a law concept and it's not going to work. The law is just going to kill them. They're just going to feel guilty. They won't be able to do it. Now, I want them to behave eventually properly too. But the means by which I help them do that is to get established alive and free in Christ and learn to walk by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. Then they won't carry out the desires of the flesh. That's the New Testament covenant. It's to live under the grace of God in His power by faith. Now we'll come back to that. So, I mean, you know, here we are trying to change people's behavior. What God's trying to change, number one, is who we are. That had to happen. Uh, and He did. We're new creations in Christ. And then, how are we transformed? By the renewing of our minds. If you walk by faith, how are you sanctified? By faith. By faith, folks. I mean, this is the Galatian heresy. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? How did you come to Christ in the first place? By the works of the Lord, hearing by faith. Ah, got that one nailed, man. We're Protestants. Justification by faith and faith alone. Then how are you perfected? It's a rhetorical question. By the works of the law, hearing by faith. I was sharing in the men's group one time, and the leader blurted out in the back, well, by the works of the law. <laughs> Took two hours to get that foot out of his mouth. He came to me afterwards. He said, I've never heard this before. I said, you and a whole pile of others. Well, you're saved by faith. You're sanctified by faith. It's what you believe. What you do is just a reflection of what you've chosen to believe. And that cause and effect is always there. You don't do anything, anything, maybe subconscious, but you don't do anything without first thinking it. Nothing. It all begins right here. Um, now, uh, let's go on. Now, see, this is the whole basis right now of cognitive therapy. Uh, this is all going to be very practical here, but if you don't understand the theory behind it, if I just give you a tool, folks, It'll work as God uses and honors his word, but truth of the matter is if you know why. It's like the old saying, if you know how, you'll have a job, but you'll always work for the guy who knows why. And um, why does it work, what we're doing? And, and when you look at cognitive therapy, uh, which essentially I believe in, if you're not familiar with the term, it's very simple really. People are feeling what they're feeling and doing what they're doing because of what they've chosen to believe or think. Therefore, if you wanted to change their behavior or their behavior or their feelings, what would you change? What they think or believe. Now, I agree with that. The, the tendency, humanly, is, is that you have some activating event and that's what caused me to feel this way. You made me mad. Not true. Because between that outside event and my emotional response, is this. Because <laughs> all my five senses do is to prick, pick up senses from this world. All that data is just taken to your brain. And again, let me just say, you are not affected by the environment. You are affected by your perception or what you believe about that environment. It's how you process the data. And that's going to change as you grow. And... Uh, and as you see the world more and more from God's perspective, and it's going to change a lot after the break. We're going to take a little break here tomorrow. So. <laughs> but um, uh, now let me illustrate that. Because this is, should be in your syllabus here. If what you believe does not reflect truth, then what you feel does not reflect reality. If what you believe does not reflect truth, then what you feel does not reflect reality. Suppose uh, you've been working for this company for 25 years, and, um, and they're downsizing. Now, you thought you had job security. You go to work Monday morning, and there's a note on your desk from your boss. He wants to see you Friday at uh, 10.30 in the morning. Now, it's Monday, and you see that note. Why does he want to see you Friday at 10.30 in the morning? Can you imagine what that guy would go through that week? 
Initially, he may start to think, that turkey's going to lay me off. That really ticks me off. Man, I've been an employee here for 25 years. And, uh, and he may get madder and madder the more he thinks about it. That I'm, I'm going to get laid off. And uh, so he goes home and he pounds on his wife and he says, I'm not going to give him the satisfaction. I'm going to go in there tomorrow and quit. And his wife slaps him silly so he doesn't. And uh, then he starts to become very anxious about it. Hmm. You know, how am I going to afford college for the kids? How am I, somebody at my age is going to get a, a job now, a second career kind of a thing? And now he's anxious. And I'll come back to this. Anxiety is the subject we're going to talk later on. But anxiety, in the root word, Merimaneo, is marizo divide, new us mind. He's the double minded man. And the double minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And so he's anxious now. And come about Thursday, he's depressed. It's hopeless. I'm going to lose my job. I don't think I'm going to find another one. He's depressed. He's just hopeless. And so this guy has experienced anger, fear, anxiety, depression. And come Friday morning, 1030, he's a basket case emotionally. And he drags himself into his boss's office. And he says, congratulations, we made you vice president. <laughs> Pow, he faints on the spot. <laughs> and he takes the job away. No. No. Uh, <laughs> All of that emotion he experienced that week was not based on truth. That's right. If what you believe does not reflect truth, then what you feel does not reflect reality. What's even troublesome about it is his boss could be observing him that week. Huh, maybe I should think whether I want to give this guy a promotion or not. He's been up and down all week emotionally here. <laughs> uh, I've seen this happen all over the world, my own life, your life. And uh, you think something happened, and you get mad, and you're angry, and then you find out the truth later on. You go, all that anger I felt during that time was just based on a lie. And all i got to do is distort your walk with God, is to get you to believe a lie about God and about yourself. Two most important beliefs that you possess. I'm just a loser. What do losers do? They lose. <laughs> well, I'm just a sinner. What do sinners do? They sin. Who are you? Children of God. Do you believe it? It's a great work of the Holy Spirit to bear witness with your spirit. You're a child of God. If you really believe that, do you think it would have some effect the way you live? No person can consistently behave in a way that's inconsistent with what they believe about themselves or about God. You can't do it. You're just living out what you believe. We all are. You tracking your folks? I mean, this has everything to do with counseling, as you can see it. If you got people coming in and seeing you in ministry, they're building a pack of lies. Who's the father of lies, by the way? Saying this. Church is the pillar and support of truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth. You know that truth, what'll happen? Set you free. If that's the case, what are you in bondage to? Lies. Lies. The whole world is under the power of the evil one. How? He's deceived the whole world. It's all deception. Like the Wizard of Oz. Turned out to be a grumpy little man behind a megaphone. Actually, if you could see a demon, it'd be a little bitty picker with a great big mouth. It's just all lies. It honestly is. He's defeated. He's disarmed. But uh, if you don't know that, then you get bummed around a little bit. And see, well, let's go to the next step here, the next slide probably. Is, is, see what happens is, let's call God's way plan A, man's way plan B. God has no plan Bs, by the way. He doesn't shift around or deviate. He stays the same. His ways are always the same. And what happens is, if you're stuck in this world and you're flopping back and forth between plan A and plan B, trying to have the best of both worlds, you're going to be anxious. Because that's actually what anxiety means, is double-mindedness. Now, truth of the matter is, every new Christian is carnal by nature. And Paul, I think, acknowledges that. I think he expects that. Your mind's been programmed to live independent of God. Now you have the mind of Christ in there, so you can experience a little tension in the growth process. You're falling back on the old tried and true, your old flesh patterns, you know, that kind of thing, or you're learning to do it a different way. And, and we ought to understand that. You know, we don't have that great expectation. That's why you're not to 
lay your hands too soon on a new convert because truth of the matter is when push comes to shove he's probably going to fall back on old flesh patterns that he has and, and dealing or coping with life. You know, we grow out of those things. There's no instant way to renew our minds, but it's, it's part of our growth process. Um, for instance, in a religiously sense, Jesus said, you nicely set aside the commandments of God to observe your traditions. So anyway, essentially, that you have a man-made religion and follow that, truth is, is you're taken away then from plan A. Any movement towards plan B, by definition, removes you away from plan A. Uh, look at marriage. What's God's plan A for marriage? Lifetime monogamous relationship or richer for poor till death do us part. Now, see, what should happen is when we do premarital counseling, if we should not only tell them this is a covenant relationship, but you're making a commitment, which means then that you won't entertain thoughts contrary to that. Because I promise you, you will be tempted to. I promise you. You'll be tempted to. And, and dear people, you can carry on an entire affair in your mind. And you can actually bond. That's why we have stalkers to people. Because it's just an affair that's been going on in their mind. And they start to think, hmm, I wonder what it would be like to be married to him or her. From that point on, everything is fantasy. You don't have a clue what it would be like to be married to him or her. Not a clue. That's why we got all these beautiful Hollywood people jumping in and out of each other's beds and divorcing three and four and five and six times. You know, she looks good, or he looks good, you know. Well, he's a macho guy, and he beats her up. Anyway, it's like the boss who's got the perfect secretary. Ah, oh, man, instantly obedient, looks out for his best interest. Uh, he starts to think, huh, what a good wife she would be. So he divorces his wife and marries his secretary. And they get up in the first morning, and he says, uh, Give me some coffee, would you? Well, get it yourself. I'm not your secretary anymore. <laughs> Been had. He lived in a fantasy world. Had no idea what being married to that woman would be like. What kind of a person she is actually at home. Someone came up in the Westwood Plaza Hotel, Century City, saw Paul Newman step into an elevator as the doors were closing. Are you the real Paul Newman? As the door closed, he said, only when I'm alone. Good answer, actually. <laughs> now, what makes marriage unique? Love? No. You're supposed to love all mankind. What makes it unique is commitment. What makes it good? Romance. But what makes it unique is commitment. It's a covenant relationship. Now, we have to keep that in mind because romance comes and goes, doesn't it? How many have been married a few years and know that's true? Mm -mm, you know, good days, bad days. Part of the growth process. Uh, but that's why it should be a commitment, is you hang in there during those committed relationships and grow up. That's the intention behind it. God works primarily in our lives through committed relationships. Did you know that? Why? I can come here two hours a day and put on an act for me. You know, tell like I got it all together. If you really wanted to know who Neil Anderson is, who should you ask? My <laughs> wife. You know what, folks? Go ahead. Ask her. She'll probably be here next week. You know, I can go back and almost tell you the day. I decided I'm not living my life before you. Or even my wife or my kids. I'm living it before God. And the major tragedy that I see in people in ministry who fall, they're living their life before man. They're more concerned about being a man pleaser than a God pleaser. If you're a God pleaser, it doesn't make any difference if you're on the road or in your bathroom or in your bedroom, if you're alone or in your crowd. You're still the same person because you're living your life before God, not man. And the same values. They don't change to the crowd. They don't change to location. And there's only one I have to please. But if I please him... Then we make my way, even others, to be at peace with me. But it has to go back to here. And, uh, when I see people in ministry fail, more times than not, they stopped living their life before God years ago. And they're living it before man. They're all concerned what man thinks instead of what God thinks. And that's tragic. It's tragic. Galatians 1.10. It's a good verse to memorize. Call me a man pleaser. Paul says, I'm not a man pleaser. If I'm a man pleaser, I'm a bondservant of man. But if you're a God pleaser, you're a bondservant of God. 
point, don't play for the grandstand, play for the coach. It'll change your life. And what will people say? Who cares what people say? It's what God says that counts. <laughs> it's not what people say. People say all kinds of things, good, bad, wrong, right. And, uh, but it can destroy your ministry. Remember when Saul fell? First king? You know why? He says it. I was more afraid of the voice of man than I was the voice of God. So I fell. So will you. So will I. If we let the opinions of others determine who we are. Only God has that right. Um, why commitment? It has to be commitment, doesn't it? Think about marriage, you know? Nice groom comes out here, you know, scared stiff, and boom, 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 the doors open up, and here she comes. Now, man, if you're not aware of this, that's the best she's ever going to look. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that true? I mean, well, isn't it? I mean, honestly, she'll never, again, in her life, spend that much time fussing over a dress or makeup or hair, everything. Now, you have this woman to be here, and you absolutely, and so you kiss, and Next morning you wake up and she reaches over, hi. <laughs> <laughs> then you open what I, what happened to the mascara? <laughs> you, know, you know, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor. We won't even talk about your B.O. and all the problems you have. But I mean, it's, you know, that's why it's, that's life. I mean, you know, you know we're, we're, we married an imperfect person. You're aware of that. You didn't marry Adam and Eve. You married one of their fallen descendants, didn't you? And you got one of all the sick relatives with them and this weird brother and dumb uncle. <laughs> And three habits of traditions, customs, and it's life. And, um, okay, let's say you choose plan B, and you act upon it. And you act six weeks on that, you got a habit. It takes about six weeks to establish a habit. That's why a lot of our devotions are 40 days long. If I figured I can get a person into a 40-day habit, I probably can, can help them keep it. Uh, you got a habit, you, it'll eventually it'll be a stronghold. Now, what is a stronghold? It's a mental habit pattern of thought. It's memory traces. Now, here again, some call them flesh patterns, some call them defense mechanisms. You know, it's, it's, it's just the way that I learn to live, to, to cope or succeed or survive. I mean, you can find people who appear to be pathological liars. Well, if you were in a home, every time you told the truth and dad asked where you're at and you got beat up for it, what would you start doing? And start telling a lie to keep from getting beat up. I mean, so. And, but we all have them. We blame other people. Some live in denial. Some, you know, they're terrible. But, um, um, and let me just look at two or three. Then we'll have some stretching and whatever. Uh, um, let's look at the inferiority complex. I mean, it, all of these takes on a multitude of forms. But if you think about it, how could you not have to some extent. I mean, in this performance-based world where appearance, performance, and social status are everything, what if you don't, you know, how many can make the team? How many can make the cheerleader squad? How many can be the homecoming queen? How many can be the valedictorian? How many can live on that side of the tracks? You know, if everybody's there, they're going to lay down another set of tracks somewhere. I mean, in a sense, everybody struggles with this to some degree. Everybody does. And that's why in the New Testament says, if you compare yourself to another, you lack understanding. And, and that's true, but getting there is not as easy. I think I mentioned last week, I have a little book, Overcoming a Negative Self-Image. I said, and by the way, the answer is not to pick up yourself by your own bootstraps or stroke one another's eagles. That is not going to work. You keep telling that cute little girl she's cute, and you're going to end up with an anorexic. You're building up the wrong thing. And uh, You ever seen an ugly anorexic, by the way? I mean, they may be now, but they weren't originally. But that's, if all your life, all you got strokes for was how well you look, what are you going to focus on? How well you look. And this is where I'm getting all of my information, so that's what you're going to focus your whole growth on. And um, next thing you know, you, you just simply, it's a body cult, essentially. It's my whole value in life and persona is wrapped up in how I look. Not who I am, but just how I look. You know, men are just as sick, you know. They see a woman as a, as a, like a sexual predator, you know. They want sex. They don't want a relationship, they want sex. And it's just as sick, worse maybe. 
because at least one just violates himself, the other one violates somebody else, which is worse. Um, but how do you overcome this? I mean, even as Christians, I find this confusing. And frankly, uh, off base in a lot of our churches, where, where, do, where does a Christian get a legitimate sense of worth? Spiritual gifts? Oh, I've seen, I've seen people who just pursue that. Uh, but why does, why does it say in 1 Corinthians 12, when he's talking about spiritual gifts, why does he say that God has given more abundant honor to those who are less seemly? How about talents? God has given some one talent, some two, some five. Come on, God. Is that fair? Don't you know, Lord, only the five talented Christian can have any legitimate sense of worth? Hmm, that's not true. Actually, my observation is the, wo the ones who are more naturally gifted or talented have a tendency to focus so much on that that oftentimes their character gets bankrupt or doesn't grow. Uh, is it intelligence? God chose the foolish things in the world to confound the wise. Is it beauty? I mean, one of the great prophecies of Christ was that he would have no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him. People were attracted to Jesus, not because he was uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger or something like that. It was because of his holiness. It was his love. It was his beauty. It was his gentleness that uh, just attracted people to him. That's what should attract them to us, for that matter, if we're like him. Uh, so what is it? <laughs> Think about this now. Where does a man have a tendency to get his identity? From his work. When you meet a man for the first time, what's the first thing you want to know about him? What's he do for a living, right? How about our ladies? It's changing in the last 30, 40, 50 years. By and large, it's motherhood, isn't it? Mom carries her own photos, kids, grandkids. Now think about that for a moment. If that is true, by the way, where'd we get that? Oh, Genesis 3. Man shall work by the sweat of his brow, and her woman shall bear a child in pain. Folks, that's the curse. What if you never had a job? What if you lost your job? What if you never got married? What, if you, what, what, what happens when the empty nest comes? What if you couldn't have kids? You'd have no sense of worth? But that, that's what the world, that's where the world is at. That's the fall. But what about you and I? Now, the truth of the matter is getting a person out of that worldly kingdom into the kingdom of God, where God loves all of his people the same. We're all children of God, the great equalizer. Not an easy thing. But truth of the matter is, if you knew who you were in Christ, and you tied into God's great goal, and your life was characterized by love and joy and peace and patience and goodness, would you feel good about yourself? Absolutely you would. Who here can have it? Everybody exactly the same, has the same opportunity. Same opportunity. If you're on the right path. Unfortunately, we have a tendency to extol those super gifted, don't we? And super talented and sometimes super pretty. To our shame. You know, we were given an object lesson six years ago down in Bogota, Colombia. Princess Diana had just uh, been killed in Paris. I called my wife right away. I saw on CNN. Six days later, Mother Teresa died. Would you agree with me, the two most famous ladies at the end of the last century? I, I would say the two most famous, wouldn't you? Could you find two more opposite? One was very pretty. <laughs> the other one wasn't, unless you're turned on by prunes or something. But You know, one, one was very wealthy. The other one had taken a vow of poverty. Actually, both claimed an earth, a, a kingdom. One in an earthly kingdom, one in a spiritual one. Ironically, both were afforded a state funeral, and protocol didn't require it for either one. In fact, for an English woman uh, who is not part of the royal family, to be given a, a funeral like that was protocol didn't require it. And, and for India to give a state funeral to a Christian went way beyond protocol. <laughs> and yet the whole world acknowledged these two ladies for the same reason. They perceived that they cared. 
Isn't that true? Think about it. Now, you know, we as Protestants could sit here and argue about the theology of one and the character of the other and miss the whole point. They should be saying that about us, shouldn't they? They hold how they love one another if we've got the right goal. And that is God's goal for our life. You know my disciples for their love. Um, so it comes really out of our relationship with God. I, you know, I had the privilege to uh, send off a little thing for a gal's 25th wedding anniversary. She came to my college department when I first started ministry. And her daughter emailed me, said they're having their 25th, and mom and dad loved you so much, I, I married them years ago, and they're having their 25th, and would I say something? And so I wrote them something back. But I'll never forget her, to be honest with you. She came to our college department. Frankly, she had a potato body and string of hair and probably not the best complexion. Her dad was a drunken bum, left years ago. Her brother was in and out of the house, chased by the feds, running dope. Her mother had two part-time blue-collar jobs. And she walked into our college department. Everybody loved this girl. Her name was Cheryl. Uh, walked off with the nicest guy in the department, in my estimation. Got a job as a bank teller. I used to wonder, what in the world is your secret? Well, she knew she couldn't compete with the world. Frankly, she knew more than I did at that time. She just really found her place in the body of Christ and loved people, and people loved her. Yeah. And the kids rose up and honored her at the 25th, and it was such a good lesson. Um, homosexuality, stronghold. Born that way? Don't buy it for a second, folks. God created us male and female. Homosexuality is a lie. There's homosexual feelings, behaviors, tendencies, but there is no such thing as a homosexual. You know, the Winter Olympics are coming in about a week or so. They're going to have to check the sex of our ladies. Did you know they do this? Do you know how they do it? They take a swab and take mucus off the inside of their mouth. You can determine your sex that way. You can do it with a molecular sample of your skin. You can do it in your DNA. You may follow the family trend, but you can, you can by DNA, determine whether a man is a man or a woman. Do you know that? Now, listen carefully. Because of the fall, can you be genetically predisposed to certain strengths and weaknesses? Yes. But that didn't make you gay or an alcoholic. You became that by choices you made, things that have happened to you over the years. Uh, so how did they become that way? Well, in most cases of homosexuality, you can go back and find trauma in their life, usually sexual. Sexual abuse of some kind, uh, massive role reversals in the home, overbearing authoritarianism is very common. Um, they did a whole study of lesbians, everyone, the mom wore the pants at home, role reversals, stuff like that. Sometimes you can't, sometimes it's not as easy to find. It's, uh, I had a pastor came to see me, closed the door, walked in, articulate man, handsome man, early 60s, opening line. Uh, I've had homosexual thoughts and tendencies as long as I can remember. I suppose I was the absolute last resort to see if there was some spiritual connection here. But he said, I've, I've begged God to take it away. I've gone to small groups, recovery ministries, people laid hands on me, nothing. I said, what's your earliest childhood memory? Oh, that'd be two. My birth father had left. Uh, I never really knew him. Uh, my mom was a Christian. She dated this man. He'd spend the night. They didn't sleep together. He slept with me. His earliest childhood memory was that man turned his back to him, the significant other. Now, I'm not naive, naive folks. There's a lot more to it. But when he went to our Steps to Freedom, the first two people he mentioned we need to forgive was his birth father and his adoptive father. Now there's more to it and we'll come back to that. But the interesting part about this is, is, is that how do we explain it? You can go back and you can find those trauma events and some you can't seem to find it. Well let me see if I can suggest something. Here's a six-year-old boy, maybe ten, could be four for that matter. Goes to school, has a homosexual tempting thought towards another boy. That's all it is by the way. Uh, but he's not going to share that with anybody. 
I mean, nobody does by much. Uh, and the first time, it may just blow it off. I may not think about it. But let's say it's repetitive. And it, ha it happens again and again and again. And then after a while, he starts thinking, hmm, if I'm thinking that thought, I must be one of them. And that's when he bought the lie. Okay. Now, that in itself wouldn't probably entrap him. But let's say he keeps thinking about it. And what happens is after a while, if you keep thinking a certain way, will it affect how you feel? Oh, absolutely. Because your emotions are pretty much a product of your thought life. Now, that feeling begins to grow in intensity. And then when he acts upon it, and he uses his body as an instrument of unrighteousness, he's allowed sin to reign there. Now, we're going to come back to Romans 6 in another day. And it's allowed to reign there, rule in his mortal body. Would simple confession deal with that? No. No. Now, Keep all this in mind, because we'll come back to that. He, I mean, here's a great story, by the way. It's up in Cannon Beach, Christian Conference Center. Uh, a mother called me and said, I'm going to bring, if I could spend an hour with her, would she drive 60 miles and bring her son, 12-year-old boy up? And I said, sure, I'll carve out an hour for you. And so up they came. This is a great story, by the way, in every, every aspect of it. Only child, 12 years old, good-looking young boy, very popular in school, very athletic. Mom and dad were quite familiar with our ministry. And actually, we're doing it in their church. And uh, the boy, the 12-year-old boy, had actually gave a kind of a youth message in church a Sunday night a few months uh, before that. But about six months prior to this visit, this boy went to church Sunday morning, looked up at the senior pastor, and was overwhelmed with homosexual thoughts towards him. Now, here's the most unusual part about this story is told his parents. That will happen one in 10,000, maybe. And, and frankly, what it really means is, is that they must have had a very good relationship for this boy to be able to share that with his parents because 99.9% .9 of the young men and women will not do that voluntarily. Um, and secondly, this is just as miraculous, they know what to do about it, which essentially is nothing. Didn't make a big deal out of it? Son, did you want to think those thoughts? No. Have you thought them before? No. Well, where's it coming from? You? If you didn't want to think the thoughts, you're making up these feelings yourself or thoughts? Of course not. And um, actually, the only reason she came down to visit is to see, have we done enough? Is there anything more that we need to do? So I talked with the son, asked him some questions and whatever else. And I said, I said, just don't pay attention to it. It's not you, is it? No. And uh, it'll just fade away. Had that boy not shared that with his parents, I can almost tell you with precision what will happen. He'll start acting it out, 18 years old, he'll walk, step out of the closet, walk away from the church and family. And probably too late. Some may come back, but most don't. That's happening in every one of our churches, folks. Not, not an isolated case. We've all had tempting thoughts. Masters and Johnsons claim that every man has had homosexual thought at some time. I don't know how they measure that or whatever else, but... You know, there's no sin to be tempted. But if you don't know what it is, if you don't understand the battle for your mind, you don't know what to do about it. Now, that's the second part of this message, by the way. Uh, one more, and then let's have some questions if you got any. You don't have any, right? <laughs> um, let's say you're an adult child of an alcoholic. You definitely weren't born that way. Uh, but let's say in your case, it's a, it's a growing problem. Let, let's say uh, the father is the problem drinker. And by the time it becomes one of domestic violence, these, there's three boys in this family, and they respond this way. The older one stands up to dad. You lay one hand on me and so help me. The middle one accommodates. Hi, dad, how you doing? The third one runs and hides. You know, dad comes home, bellering boy, he hunts under the bed, goes next door, hides in the closet, whatever else. 20 years later, that dad is long out of the picture. Uh, these three boys are adults now. They're confronted with a hostile situation. How do you think they'll respond? Chances are the older one will fight, the middle one will accommodate, and the third will run away. That's a stronghold. They learned it. Actually, it was their choice. They were raised in the same home. They just responded to the same situation differently. And, uh, and it was really their choice at that time. Uh, now, do they have to stay that way? No. 
Uh, without some effort, they will, however. Uh, but let me put it this way. If you've been trained wrong, can you be retrained? If you learn to believe a lie, can you choose now to believe the truth? Yeah. If you've been programmed wrong, can you re be reprogrammed? Absolutely. How? That's what we're doing right now, honestly. It's yeah. what you do every Sunday in church. Hopefully, if we're doing it right. Every time you do a Bible study, every time you read your Bible, every time you put a new truth in your mind. Now, if you're doing it properly and you're repenting, you're choosing this truth, you're rejecting this which we'll get to later on, sometimes we're not doing that. We're just adding on Christianity to my, the same old person I was before. You won't be growing, I can tell you right now, because there's no repentance then. You just, you're looking at salvation as addition instead of transformation. And uh, so anyway, uh, that's what we do. That, that's what you do. That's what, essentially, it's what cognitive therapy is. If you're doing it in a very gentle fashion, we're helping people to understand what it is they believe and think and make a choice as to whether they like to keep feeling or, or living that way. And if they say no, then it's not too hard to get them to say, why don't you consider then changing your mind about what you believe about your God or your dad or somebody else. That in and of itself is not enough, however. Um, now, here's the problem. We're not just up against this world that you and I were raised in or the flesh that we're all struggling with. You're up against the world, the flesh, and the devil. If I could put it simply, if you want to grow... You bet you got to reprogram this computer, but you better check for viruses. <laughs> and and that's, that's the next subject. You better check for viruses, is what I said. Because there is not just a natural thing going on here. There is a spiritual battle going on for all of us. People are falling away from the faith, paying attention to deceiving spirits. And that is happening all over the world. Quarter two, any questions? mentioned that it takes approximately six weeks to, uh, to you know, establish a habit. Um, what is the difference between that understanding and the 21-day principle? It takes 21 days to establish a habit. Is that just a difference in opinion? Or yeah. Have there have been tests <laughs> that have said... It may take 21 for somebody and 100 for somebody else. Okay. It, it's Let's round figure. <laughs> By and large, you kind of hear 40, uh, seven weeks to establish a habit is what I've heard. I mean, could you establish, I, I think you could establish bad habits faster, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, establishing healthy habits is probably a little bit longer. Because you're kind of going against the grain of your flesh, essentially. And, and one more. When you gave the uh, scenario of the, the three sons, is that a typical arrangement no. in a family no. setting that the middle child is more passive? There's some patterns there, a birth order. Th there is, you know, truth of the matter, but, but it's not a given. The, nobody's, there are no fixed personalities out there. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing. By and large, first children take on certain characteristics, simply because they don't have an older brother or sister to show them around or shove them around. You know what I mean? And, um, but, uh, you know, Children are different. I mean, my two children, I can't believe they came from the same womb. I mean, you know, it's amazing. My, my first two grandchildren, a boy and a girl, they're just as different as daylight and dark, too. And it's just because we have personal choices. And, and truth of the matter is, they have different temperaments. And, and in one case, my son and daughter and my daughter's son and daughter, personality-wise, birth order almost flipped. Uh, so... The aggressive one is Hannah, and uh, she's younger than her brother Sammy. But Heidi, my Heidi, she's the aggressive one in our family. So you can't just say that because of the birth order, you're this kind of a person. I said, see, good parenting doesn't try to make them what we want them to do. It's really discovering who they are and, and pulling that out of them and developing what God has already planted into them. I mean, you can't even discipline the same. My daughter, she was my strong-willed one. I'd look at Heidi like this, and she'd go... I mean, it was, it was, it was a contest, and, uh, and uh, I look at my son like that, he'd melt. I mean, he was, he's my, kind of my lover. It was, it was really amazing. I mean, to, to spanking didn't mean nothing for Heidi. I mean, Carl would be effective, you know, that kind of a thing. So, you know, this idea of we'll be uniform with all of our children, I said, well, that's not even wise, because they don't respond the same. I remember I was a senior pastor. And Dobson came out with his uh, series on adolescence. And uh, 
I, I rented the whole film series, but I said, why waste it just on my church Sunday night? So I went to the public library, rented a room, made it available to the public. We had two, three hundred people every Saturday afternoon showing those films. You know, most of them pagans. It was really neat. And several brought people back to church Sunday night. Well, I I watched him at home first, and he's got a diagram in there about the compliant child and the strong-willed child. At that time, I was having a date with Dad every week with Heidi. She was about 12. And she saw the film, and I went out, and I, I drew that little diagram. I said, Heidi, where are you on this diagram? She points right in the middle. <laughs> I said, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I'm never going to take drugs. Now, she had heard the movie. Isn't that interesting? Because Dobson made the point. He said, the strong-willed child, not necessarily the bad child. Oftentimes, they're the ones who can stand up under pressure, stand alone if they have to and uh, may be more resistant to peer pressure and drugs. And so Heidi, she had saw that. She said, but I'm not going to take drugs. <laughs> and in my knowledge, she never did. But, and uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting. But, but you, you can't, uh, you know, thank God that we're all unique in that regard. And uh, we're trying to keep, put kids in our box, but really discovering the potential that each child has and trying to guide them into that potential and release them. See, parenting is an 18-year-old process of letting go. Do you know why? Because I can tell you now. Happiness is when the last dog dies and the last child leaves. <laughs> <laughs> and being a grandparent, oh man, that's really good. I tell you why. Do you know why grandparents and grandchildren get along so well? They have a common enemy. <laughs> That's not true. I love my daughter. Any other questions on this? This, this has huge implications for what we're, you, you see, what we're dealing with. Is we start building the, a theological foundation for truly Christian counseling. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, that's a great question. What, what, you know, have, never in the history of this country had we had so many diets, the Adkins diet, the South Coast diet, you know. And we're getting fatter every year. It's true, isn't it? Do you know why? I think it's kind of simple. Every diet you see is based on law. Stop eating that, start eating this. And they, and they all fail eventually. So your question is really profound. Uh, in a lot of ways. There's only one book. I mentioned this last week, I think, didn't I? I said, uh, The Diet Alternative. It's a little book went out of print and came back in again. I forget her name. But it's the only, the only thing I've seen out there. It's based on the grace of God. And, uh, you know, there's some things that humanly we can do with sheer willpower, but usually it ends up taking its toll on other aspects of our life. I mean, this driven person who can't stop running, can't stop exercising, you know, and just ends up this driven anorexic or something. It's, it's kind of sad. But I, I think that if you, we should start from a whole different basis. It all goes back again to identity. I'm supposed to be a good steward of the life that God has entrusted me with. Um, I, uh, you know, it's try to like saying, how do we keep our kids sexually pure? Well, you can go here and no farther. And this, the kid will look at you, from which end do I get to start? I mean, you know, they'll, they'll you know, <laughs> Can I kiss? Can I French kiss? Can I? And you just, you try to draw that line. It's stupid. It's a law concept. And, and it doesn't work, and it isn't working, truth of the matter. I said, what I think will work is to start from a whole different basis on, on seeing that person, not as a sex object, but as a child of God, as your sister. I remember a guy who's now my insurance dealer, actually, life insurance, was in my college department. And uh, he ended up marrying this girl, but he told me at the time, he said, I'm dating Terry right now and treating her in such a way that if I don't marry her, that her husband would have wanted me to have treated her someday. Ah, I see, that's a grace concept. Um, that's, that's getting this person to respect that other person as an individual, not as a body. And instead of seeing that as how far can I go? And I said, the forbidden fruit is always the most desirable. The moment that we forbid it, 
Do you know the law has the capacity to stimulate the desire which is intended to prohibit? Did you know that? That's why the question is asked, is the law then sinful? If you don't believe that's true, go home and say to your son, son, you can go here, but you can't go there. The moment you say that, where does he want to go? There. Probably didn't even want to go there before. What pain? Really? <laughs> Ooh, funny it is. You know? <laughs> it's true. And, and so if you base all this on a, just a purely a, a law concept, even if you're able to live up the law, you're probably going to end up being a driven person. Something else is almost controlling your life after a while. The law kills, but the Spirit gives life. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I, I believe in holistic health. I'm, you know, be 64 next summer, and I haven't been able to run. I've had some bronchitis problems here, but I mean, I exercise. I believe in that stuff. And I can still do 50 push-ups. I mean, I, I really believe in that. I believe it's, to me, it's a stewardship thing. I, I want to be able to serve God, you know, to take good, be a good steward of the body that God has entrusted me. And, uh, and, you know, when you start adapting attitudes, consider the other person more important than yourself. Have this attitude, which is also in Christ Jesus. It all comes back to your own value system and, uh, and what satisfies you. You see, the problem that we have with food, for instance, is, is that some of us are stress cases. Well, I can't smoke, can't drink. What do we do? Eat. Now, part of the problem of resolving that I mean, you can have a lust for food, that's true. But part of that is, is a temporal gratification, isn't it? I mean, you know, look at, look at health. Uh, health is an extremely hard thing to sell. To, to, to eat right, to exercise, to be a good steward. Because there's not immediate payoff. That's why it's easier to sell a pill that will alleviate the symptoms yes. than to prescribe medicine, good medicine, good holistic health, for instance, because you may not see the benefit for six weeks or six months. But if you start eating right and exercising, you may be sore for the first week, but after that, six months from now, you'll really appreciate it. But see, temporal gratification is all about wiping that out for us today. People are living from weekend to weekend and party to party. And, uh, you know, all of that reflects a whole lifestyle and a value system that we have for ourselves. And the key to that thing is not trying to stop you from going there and why don't you try some other place to go. The key to that is to really, is, is to be transferred by the renewing of your mind, is to adopt a whole different lifestyle, value system for that matter. What do you actually value? I mean, right now, we're a mess. I mean, the average home's television is on seven hours a day. You know, the average American adult, only 5% read a book a year or more. But amongst the Christian population, it goes all the way up to 6%. <laughs> My wife screws that curve up. She reads two, three a week. But uh, I prefer to ask her what she read and get the synopsis. <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like ADD or ADHD today. I said, why, why are we having this proliferation of this problem? The answer is, is never single. Uh, I think that has a lot to do with uh, a lack of discipline, uh, eating habits. Uh, our kids are eating pop and chips after school. Uh, they're not being disciplined. They don't have work. That, that was never options for me. I mean, I don't know what to do with our kids today. When I grew up on a farm, I had to work. I didn't get paid for it either. You know, it's just your obligation. And, uh, and frankly, cause and effect was built in. If we didn't plant a crop in the spring, we didn't harvest. If we didn't feed the sheep, they died. And so that was all built in for me. I mean, I grew up with cause and effect. Go to a high schooler today and ask him, what do you want to do when you're 30? I don't know. Would you like to have a good job? Well, of course. House? Yeah. When do you think you're making that decision? <laughs> they don't know, folks. Ask them. They think it'll happen somehow. And, you know, unfortunately, we're just selling out the future for just temporal gratifications today like crazy. And nobody's helping them hardly. And we, we kind of capitulate to them and play little games with kids in school. I said, why don't my Jewish friends get them to study Hebrew and learn Hebrew? I hated Hebrew. And they get these 12-year kids learn Hebrew before they can pass their bar mitzvah. And if you can challenge those kids, you know, challenge them. I think that's part of our problem today, don't you? We're not giving them a challenge of life. 
And part of it is prolonged adolescence, your kid from 12 to 20. I wish I had an answer, a simple answer for that one for you. Can't all go out and work on the farm, unfortunately. I sent my kid from L.A. to the farm for three summers. The farm I grew up and then went back. He just loved it. Actually, he stayed and finished the whole fall semester, fall semester one time. Wanted to be there for harvest season. And uh, it's a healthy lifestyle. Do you have a question? Yeah, you know, even things like smoking cessation, mm -hmm. you know, how, um, you know, there's so many different programs and how to do it because it's all the behavioral it's behavioral modification. modification. But see, why are they smoking? I mean, sure, there's a nicotine addiction there, probably. But, but isn't it a stress matter? Don't I have to have something in my hand? Don't know I... See, the, the key is not to just abstain. You're going to hear me say this again and again. You take that alcohol away from the alcoholic, what do you got? A dry drunk. I'm going to speak in a recovery conference in about three weeks in Minneapolis. Big thing. And fourth year in a row, I'll keep asking me back. I, I said, but... We start talking about dual diagnosis as baloney. It's multiple. Show me anybody addicted to anything. Number one, they feel good about themselves? Of course not. Are they anxious? You bet. Are they, they feel guilty? Of course they do. Shameful? Yes. Nervous? Depressed? And are you going to solve that by taking away the alcohol? That's what they were using to cope. And that's why the failure rate is so high, because you just took away their temporary means of coping. If abstinence was the goal, then Ephesians 5.18 would say, Be not drunk with wine, therefore stop drinking. What's the answer? Fill with God's Spirit. That's good. See, the, here's the point is, it's like taking an old bone away from a dog. You ever try it? You got a dog fight, man. Throw a mistake. <laughs> And, and that's what we have the option to do. See, I, I bought something years ago, and I still think this is true. I really try to make a commitment as a pastor not to prohibit where I couldn't provide. If all my message was, you've got to stop doing that, or you can't do that, then what that offered them, it offered them something, friendship, peer pressure, whatever. If I'm not replacing that with something else, what are they going to do? They're going to fall back to that again. You've got to give them something better. Uh, just to take it away without providing a better way that their needs could be met, that they could do so. It's not going to work. And it is going to work. And that's why the, the success rate is so abysmal. So, you know, for example, um, in like a recovery process, say, again, using the, the, using the example of smoking cessation, you know, it's because I work in a medical clinic. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always have patients, you know, coming in and they want the instant Prozac and, you know what I mean, depression. Mm -hmm. I don't have the time to spend with them, you know what I mean, talking about all these things. But, you know, God has been laying it on my heart, especially in the area of smoking cessation. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like you could, um, in a secular clinic, you know, we couldn't. But I think I would, could get permission from them to, you know what I mean, to do mm -hmm. something, you know, in that, in that area, like after hours or something. That. So just thinking about how you would do it, you would apply the, the principles of, yeah, you know, being filled with the Holy Spirit. There's more than that, though. we got more to cover. I, you're, you're raising the critical question of this whole 12 weeks we have together. <laughs> and, and, uh, but thank you for that. I mean, honestly, I mean, but down the line, you'd almost, what, what got them into it in the first place? Peer pressures because everybody did it? Or I'm so blooming nervous right now, if I don't have something in my hand, I'm going to light my finger. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's... Uh, and part of that is that. A lot of these people are just flat out nervous. And that's why when they stop smoking, guess what they start doing? Eating. And they put 20, 30 pounds. Boom, just like that almost. And, um, wow, well, there's, there's, some, there's, there's something else going on here. And 99% and, and of the time when anybody comes in with a problem, you're dealing with a symptom and not the cause. And if all we're doing is dressing the symptoms and not the cause, then truth of the matter is they'll just go to another symptom probably. Uh, so, it's a critical question. I mean, you know, getting people out of addictive behaviors is, you know, is really the test of the church today. Can we live a righteous life? Can I say no? You know, by the way, 
Is that an adequate answer, the D.A.R.E. program, just say no? The government finally gave up on it. <laughs> they, they scrapped the program, didn't work one bit. Because you have to get to the root. Well, you know, it's just a law concept again. I mean, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't tell you what to say yes to. Yeah, there's nothing to replace it. There's nothing, you're just taking away that. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, I, I'll close with this. I mean, this was years ago, but I was the pastor, and this friend came to me. My sister, you know, she went through divorce, and she met this guy. He's not a Christian, and he asked her to live with her, and now he's living with her, and the two kids are there, and this, they're not married, and they're living. I said, I don't like that either. I said, uh, the guy is paying the bills, and his kids are getting fed, and in his own pagan way, he is taking care of her, and you want her to just move out and do what? Where would she go? I said, um, my personal feeling is, if you go over there and, and say, this really upsets me, you need to stop doing this, you need to be prepared to let her move into your home. And if you're not prepared to do that, I don't think you have the right to tell her not to do that. And I feel that way too. I, I think this is where the church gets hurt so bad. All we do is, is, is to say, you can't do those things without saying, then how do my needs get met? When Titus says, teach your people to meet pressing needs so they won't be unfruitful, everybody's needy, and if, if their needs aren't getting met appropriately, they're going to get met inappropriately somehow. And uh, so if we don't have a way for that need to be met in that person appropriately, and just take away the inappropriate way that it's being met, they'll go right back to it. Don't you think? But, uh, so, you know, if all we're offering the you know, people just come and listen and buy our program, probably not doing enough. Good questions. I mean, you know, this is, this, I hope this is where we're, we're heading. I mean, I really want to get down to the core issues. And, and, and one of the big ones is, is that we got to have a, an honest answer for how a legitimate sense of worth is met. I mean, truth of the matter is, that's one of the great needs that people have. Tell me I'm somebody. You know, I feel like a nobody. And, uh, but that's where the gospel is so different, because you are somebody. I mean, Christ gave up his life just for you. Knew you from the foundations of the world. I mean, the answers are there, but, but we can't have cliche answers. We, we've got to get it in a way that they say, ah, aha, I got it. And uh, in my experience, if there isn't genuine repentance, the answers go over their head. So we tried to show last week. I said, uh, they're not able to receive it because they haven't dealt with the conflict in their life. Once the conflict is dealt with, the whole pursuit changes and the whole growth process changes. Well, you've been a patient group. I, I didn't get as far tonight because next week I'm going to have to pick up and say, okay, what is this virus? What is this spiritual battle? And, uh, and, and this is critical because it really is the difference between you know, pagan and Christian as to what those voices are in our head. And so we need to have some biblical clarification on that. So we'll pick it up next week. And we'll look at the battle for your mind. God bless. Thank you.